talking about genomics and proteomics. Um, and I've got a nifty picture there. That's the kind of picture you put on a slide when you don't have anything to put on the slide, but you want a picture there. Because <laughs> just putting a piece of DNA on your slide just makes your talk look cooler, right? <laughs> Looks smart. Uh, I actually hate these illustrations because they don't at all reflect the molecular structure of DNA, right? It's not like noodles and little crosses. <laughs> uh, what we've been talking about up to this point has been genetics, how traits have been inherited, and we've started now talking about genomics, right? We've talked about DNA sequencing and actually getting the sequence and the structure and where genes are located on chromosomes. So we've segued, without me telling you, into what we call genomics. So I thought, well, we should probably clarify some terms here. Uh, so genomics is not necessarily uh, how traits are inherited in terms of like inheritance patterns or things like that. Uh, we're talking about actually what is the DNA sequence? What are, is the physical map of the chromosome? Uh, so this is genomics. It's the sequencing and the physical mapping of an organism's genome. Now, the Human Genome Project told us what all the nucleotides were in the human genome. But that doesn't tell you much, because what we actually want to know is more about genetics, more about cell biology, more about why traits are the way they are. And so if you have all the nucleotides, that's just a string of A's, T's, G's, and C's. So very shortly after sequencing the entire genome, we transitioned into what we call functional genomics. What are the regions on the genome that are actually doing things, right? So, Functional genomics is the study of the functional elements of an organism's genome. This is what, traditionally, this has been what proteins are expressed in the organism, right? Uh, the, 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 the central dogma of molecular biology, do you remember me talking about Francis Crick and the central dogma? Um, Crick, and when people were first deciding how is DNA actually inherited, how are traits actually inherited, um, Crick proposed this model that said, well, DNA codes for mRNA, mRNA codes for protein, and that was the central dogma. It was the proteins that matter. Proteins are what are giving you your phenotype. Um, so when we went to sequence the entire genome, we didn't know how many proteins were made in the human genome. Uh, we knew how many proteins were expressed in bacteria. We knew how many genes were located on the Drosophila genome. The, uh, the nematode worm genome had been done, uh, but we didn't know how many were in the human genome. And there was actually a lot of predictions that, about how many genes were going to be encoded. Uh, it turns out, when we actually started doing functional genomics, you sequence the entire genome and then try to identify how many protein coding regions are there, it turns out that we had a roughly equivalent number of genes. There's only about 24,000, 24 to 25,000 protein coding genes in the human genome. It's about the same as a Drosophila fruit fly, same as a nematode worm, um, which is a huge surprise, right? Because if the central dogma of molecular biology is true, then the more complex an organism you are, the more proteins you should have, right? The more traditional things that we call genes you should have, right? Um, so this is the study of, of these functional elements. And while I'm talking about this, I want to talk about this idea of junk DNA. So, we sequence the human genome, you only roughly, you have three billion base pairs, but you only had about 25, 24, 25,000 proteins, which means that the bulk of the genome actually doesn't code for proteins. If you're actually just to take the sequences of DNA that actually get converted into amino acid, you only have about one and a half percent of the nucleotides. Only one and a half percent of the three billion nucleotides actually code for amino acids. So this has been termed junk DNA. Then everything else in the genome, if the, if the molecular biology central dogma is true and that proteins are what really matter, then 98 percent of your genome is, is useless, basically, is not functional. And so uh, this has actually been Traditionally, this has been an argument actually against design, against the fact that your genome and that your human body was actually designed by a creator. Um, I heard this when I was in school. This has been written in print by numerous people. Um, why would a creator create a genome that had so much junk, non-coding stuff that's just randomly in there? 
and only 1.5% of your genome is actually functional. So the argument goes, evolution is non-directed, non-specified, it's just random mutations, random duplications, and so evolution and a naturalistic mechanism would pro project that you do have a lot of junk just floating around, and that's being under selective pressure. Uh, the design argument would say, well, no, somebody intelligently designed the genome, and so everything actually should be there doing something, right? So this has been an argument against design. Now, the non-coding part was considered junk because proteins are what we thought were the real functional units, right? So the rest was considered junk. This was just accumulated because of genome duplications. So part of a chromosome duplicated, and so I had two of the same protein. But if I only need one of those proteins, the other one is free to get mutated, right? So junk DNA was thought of to be just random mutation and duplication events that had happened throughout the organism's, you know, genetic history, and that all of this was kind of new, um, a pool of DNA that you could kind of select from. So it was non-functional, but it was a pool of DNA that mutations could arise and new genes might be coming out of this. So the idea of junk DNA for a long time has actually been a kind of a pivotal key point in, in evolutionary theory. The way you get new traits is not by breaking current genes, right? If to make a human being you have to have 25,000 functional genes, well, you can't start mutating those because they're likely to, to not function properly, right? So the idea of, of evolutionary development was, okay, well, I've got all these essential genes, but if I've got duplicated copies, then I can mutate the duplicated copies, and they might be non-functional for a while. But after a while, mutations might build up, and that gene might then gain a new function. And so then you could get a new trait coming, right? So this was like a resource, a pool of DNA that could be used for developing new traits. Um, it turns out, and we've been having a lot of evidence increasing ever since the Human Genome Project, that a lot of this, what we call junk DNA, actually does have function, right? Now, early on, we knew that there are certain parts of the genome that you have to have, right? You have to have telomeres. You have to have centromeres. Those are non-protein coding, but they perform an important role, right? If you don't have telomeres, then your chromosomes degrade. And if you don't have centromeres, you can't divide them in meiosis. We also knew that you had to have transfer RNAs and ribosomal RNAs. And so we knew of some things that were non-coding that was still functional. But again, if you added all of that up, you still had like 80 or 90 percent of the genome that wasn't doing anything. Um, the ENCODE project started looking for, well, it's the encyclopedia, E-N-C, of DNA elements is what the ENCODE project was. And basically, it's a search for functional things in the genome. It turns out that there is no junk DNA in the genome. The ENCODE project has been looking closer and closer, and it turns out that actually 90% or more of the genome actually does get made into something. Now, it's not getting made into protein, but it's being transcribed. And sorry for my pointer, you can't see it. Transcribed, so it's being made into RNA. And that RNA is actually providing a lot of very functional roles in the cell. It's not the traditional central dogma that the proteins are what's doing things. It's here the RNA is actually doing things. So there's a huge class of these non-coding RNAs, sometimes called functional RNAs, because they are not actually, they're not mRNAs, they're not being made into protein, but as an RNA unit, they're still being functional. And let me just, I'll just show you. These guys are called microRNAs. Some of them are called uh, small nuclear RNAs small nucleolar RNAs, peewee RNAs, long non-coding RNAs. We got a huge class of hundreds, thousands of different um, functional RNAs that don't fit the traditional dogma. Yeah. Really fast question. Is sure. It, it, it could project, uh, uh, are they or no, no, no. This is NCBI, National Center for Biotechnology, so NIH. Um, oh, okay. So there's no there's no theistic agenda behind the ENCODE. They're just trying to see what, what does the f genome do, right? Okay. And then when you say they code for something, are they, uh, are they necessary, meaning can we take yeah. them out? Yeah. So if we took them out, it would be a problem. Yeah. 
and we've identified dozens and dozens of human diseases or metabolic conditions that are the result of mutations in these non-coding things. Right? What these actually turn out to do is a lot of um, protein regulation. So small nuclears are involved in splicing. So alternative splicing, the way you splice a gene, is controlled by RNAs. Right? So you might have a protein that can be spliced in you know, one of 12 ways. How does the cell determine which way it splices it? It does it by expressing some of these small nuclear RNAs. Small nucleolar RNAs are in the nucleolus, you know, uh, where the ribosomes are being assembled, so those are important. Um, Peewee RNAs and long non-coding RNAs, as well as micro RNAs, are helping to actually determine at what extent do mRNAs get turned on and turned off. They're actually regulating which mRNAs get made. So proteins are obviously very important, but they're not the entire story. How much and what kind of protein you're, being, you're making um, is being coded for by the cell, and, and these are the functional units that are, tr are helping determine when you turn a protein on. What version of the protein do you turn it on? When should you degrade an mRNA and not make it anymore? Um, how do you splice it? How do you edit it? All of these things um, are, are going on in somewhere between 90 and 93 is the last number I saw. 93% of the genomes being actually made into functional stuff. Now, that's going to give you then roughly 10% that's not actually being transcribed into protein or RNA. But we wouldn't want to say that that 10% is not functional or is junk in any traditional manner. Because again, you have to have centromeres. You have to have telomeres. Those are structurally very important to the chromosome. If you're missing telomeric ends, then your cell can't divide. Right? That's one of the ways a cell knows how old it is, is how long its telomeres are. So it's an important regulator of cell age. So if you're losing your telomere regions, uh, the cells will stop dividing. Right? If you lose your centromeres, right, you can't pair up your sister chromatids. You can't make the kinetochore and pull chromosomes apart in meiosis. Um, there's also some repetitive regions. But these repetitive regions, we're realizing, are actually kind of functional as well. The distance between certain genes is important. And um, there are these cis and trans acting elements. And the way you organize your chromosomes in the nucleus uh, certain chromosomes lining up with each other, they can influence the expression on other ways. So uh, even though we may not know what some of these repetitive elements are, distance away on a chromosome is important. So you can kind of start to think, well, maybe just having some repetitive region to keep certain genes far apart on the chromosome is an important thing to do. So this idea of junk DNA has completely fallen out of favor. Um, a Christian guy named Jonathan Wells wrote a book a couple of years ago, actually before the big gene uh, encode announcements come, came out, uh, arguing against junk DNA. So there's been growing evidence over the last you know, decade or so of junk DNA not being true. Uh, it's just finally kind of reaching the public and kind of reaching this threshold of like, yeah, you know what? It doesn't seem like any of it's junk, which poses a real problem for evolution too, because if Having junk DNA that you can just tinker with to develop new genes is, is your model for how you get new traits. Well, if the entire genome is actually doing something functional, then you can't tinker with any of it, right? If you start tinkering with any of this non-coding uh, non DNA, well, it might not code for protein, but if you manipulate these microRNAs or these peewee RNAs or these long non-codings, then you're not going to express the proteins in the proper way. And so what, what is the raw material for new evolutionary traits? It can't be junk DNA, right? It's got to, if the naturalistic story is true, new, uh, new genes have got to come from somewhere else. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, part of this non-coding, what was considered junk DNA too, it, are things called pseudogenes which is a sequence, and as you're reading through the genome, you come across what looks like a protein coding sequence, and it's really similar to another protein. Uh, it looks like there's a duplicated copy of that protein, but in it is a mutation, or in it is a mutation in its regulatory region, so as it doesn't get expressed, uh, 
or if it would get expressed, it would have been a mutant version. Uh, these have been called pseudogenes, right? It looks like a gene, but it isn't, isn't actually functioning. Um, there's actually been numerous evidences where thought, uh, genes that are thought to have been pseudogenes actually are getting made into mRNA, but then the mRNA is edited to take out the mutation, and it's actually a functional gene. So you can only tell so much from the genome, right? If you read the sequence in the genome and, it, and there's a mutant nucleotide, that doesn't necessarily mean that that mutant nucleotide is actually what gets made in the mRNA or actually gets made into the protein. Since we can splice certain things out and we can edit the mRNA, uh, what looks like a pseudogene in the genome might actually be made. There's other pseudogenes that end up getting made into mRNA, and even though they have a mutation and they don't get made into, uh, into protein, they're actually very important for regulating the gene that they have sequence homology to. So pseudogenes um, are more and more we're discovering that those are functional as well. We thought they were non-functional because the model was they must be made into protein to be functional. But turns out you can make a mutant sequence and that might still be important for regulating the, the other gene. So this is the myth of junk DNA. There is no junk DNA. So as we're thinking about what elements are functional, uh, this has been classified in kind of two main categories, th sometimes three. But functional genomics is, number one, the transcriptome. That is, all of the pieces of the genome that get made into RNA, whether it's mRNA or, or these functional non-coding RNAs. So this is the, the ENCODE project that was looking for all of these. Right. We're going to spend time today talking about the transcriptome, talking about how do you detect what transcripts, what mRNAs or what non-coding RNAs a cell is making. Right. Because we have the human genome, right? We know the human genome, but we don't necessarily know which part of the genome your cells are expressing. Right. What is the difference between what genes that a liver cell and a kidney cell expresses, right? We have to actually look at those cells and see what part of the genome are they expressing. The other half of, of, the trend, or of uh, functional genomics is the proteome. And this is the traditional what things get are, are getting made into protein, right? So the proteome studies the structure and the function of all the proteins that are expressed in a cell or in a tissue or in an organism at a certain developmental stage, right? So these two are, um, they're more dynamic things to study, right? The human genome doesn't really change that much. We can, we can sequence everybody in the room and we could do comparative genomics, right? And see what nucleotides you have and what changes I have, you know, what differences are between us. Uh, but that's kind of static in a way, right? Mutations are fairly rare. And so there's not a lot of differences. So, I mean, comparing genomics is important, right? But when you're studying functional genomics, uh, this is much more dynamic because it's saying, what does the cell decide to express? And so one tissue might express one gene, and then later in life, that same tissue might stop expressing that gene. Or certain tissues might always express different things. At a developmental time stage, you know, an embryo is expressing certain genes to do certain functions. But once a tissue has been made, they stop expressing those genes and they start expressing other ones. Right? So the transcriptome is very, very different. We can, there's almost an infinite number of studies that we can do in the transcriptome because cells are always changing what levels or what genes they're expressing at any time. The proteome, the same way, right? Which proteins you're expressing, whether the protein's turned on or turned off, how it's modified, um, the proteome is always changing as well. So the proteome is the structure and the function of proteins. And kind of a subdivision of the proteome is something called structural genomics. That's trying to identify the actual three-dimensional shape of every protein and how proteins change their conformation, <coughs> how they do their chemistry. This is kind of getting into biochemistry here, right? How proteins actually fold and change, how they get modified, what different conformations they take when they're doing their chemical reactions and things like that. All right. So we're going to talk about the transcriptome today, right? We've already kind of talked about genomics. We're going to talk about the transcriptome and how you detect when genes are being expressed. And then we'll move in and we'll do a little bit of proteomics um, 
after the break. So we started doing this a little bit last time, but we're going to get real thick into now. How do you actually detect when mRNAs are being made? How do you detect when, uh, what the transcriptome is? Right? And we started off when we already started talking about reporter genes or reporter constructs. This is where you clone a promoter region and you hook it up to some gene that reports back to you when that gene gets turned on. Right? So if I'm looking at the expression of, of a gene, I don't really care so much about its mRNA sequence because what's determining if that gene gets turned on is its promoter region. Right? The part of it that's determining when and where RNA polymerase sits down and makes an mRNA. So we talked about reporter constructs when we started talking about expression vectors. So I'm just going to review an expression vector. So an expression vector is, is any piece of DNA that we have modified such that you actually get an mRNA made off of it. Okay? So this isn't just cloning for the sake of getting a piece of DNA so that we can sequence it or manipulate it. We're actually trying to get something made in the cell. So a reporter construct or an expression vector has a couple of additional things that a normal vector doesn't have. Okay, so an expression vector is going to have an RNA polymerase binding site. We want RNA polymerase to come down and make a copy of, of whatever we've got in there. And then we have to, whatever it's making, we need to make sure that it remains stable in the cell. So it has to have a 5 prime and a 3 prime UTR so that if you get this expression vector made into bacteria, when it actually makes an mRNA, when the, when the bacteria recognizes this promoter region, sits down RNA polymerase, the thing that you actually make, the mRNA that you actually make, the cell recognizes as something that it should keep around. So you have to put 5 prime and 3 prime UTRs so that that transcript, that mRNA that gets made, actually stays around and gets made into protein, right? Because that's the whole idea is we're trying to get something to report back to us. And an mRNA itself is not going to report back to us. A functional gene is going to have to be made in the term of a functional protein is going to have to be made, right? So the functional protein is what we call the reporter itself. And this could be just something that turns color. Um, is usually how it is. So LAC-Z gene will turn, if you put X-Gal in there, it'll turn it blue. So wherever this gene is being expressed, I would put the promoter of that in front of my reporter that's in green here. And if that's LAC-Z, then wherever the LAC-Z gene is expressed, it's going to turn that solution blue. The cell's going to turn blue. Or it could be luciferase and it'll glow, or it could be GFP and it'll fluoresce back to you a different wavelength of light that you shine at it. Right. So anything that actually reads back to you where the expression happened is the reporter. But what it's actually reporting to you is where and when that gene gets turned on because of the promoter that you put there. Okay. So uh, this promoter region or this enhancer region is from your gene that you're actually interested in. Right. So you have to grab, instead of the coding region of your gene, you grab the regulatory region and you stick it in front of the gene that's going to report back to you. So we showed you this one before. This is that gene called brachyury. And so what, we, what uh, the experimenters did here is they took the regulatory region, the, the upstream region that determines when brachyury gets turned on, and they put it in an expression vector next to LAC-Z. And then it, this is in C squirts. It's the C squirt brachyury gene. So here's the normal embryo of the C squirt. This guy is actually transgenic, so when we soak this embryo in XGAL, the LAC-Z gene breaks the XGAL down and turns it blue wherever brachyury is expressed. Right? So it's telling you all these blue cells are in the notochord of this organism. So the brachyury gene is getting turned on in the notochord. So when the C squirt turns on brachyury, it also turns on this expression vector turns on the LAC-Z gene, and those cells turn blue. Right. So we're detecting where genes are expressed. Reporter constructs are, are really helpful because um, you can see in the organism where the gene is expressed. Right. I'm actually looking at an embryo 
and I'm looking at which cells are turning this gene on. Right? This is really nice because I don't have to dissect out every single tissue in the organism. Right? If I was just looking from mRNA, um, well, we'll get to it in a minute, but I'm actually keeping the whole embryo intact, and I'm looking cell by cell. Uh, in other things, you have to actually dissect out the tissue, right? If I was doing some other, if I was making like a, a cDNA library, and I wanted to know what genes are expressed in the notochord, I would have to get thousands of C squirts and cut out all the cells of their notochord, and then isolate the mRNA, make my library, and see what's expressed, right? Here, I don't have to do that, because I can get this expression vector into all the cells of the embryo, and then it reports back to me what was being expressed, and I don't have to dissect anything. I don't have to separate tissues out and extract DNA or RNA from them. I can just look right in the embryo. Questions about expression vectors? Now, you can only do one gene at a time, really, right? So you have to make an expression vector for every gene you're, you're interested in. So you have to go into the genome. You have to know where your gene is located. You have to know what the regulatory region, or at least have an idea of what the regulatory region is. Isolate that, either by PCR or, or some other way to actually get that regulatory region. Clone it, and then get it into the organism. Right? That's actually a, a pretty elaborate setup to get this data. But it's really good data, right? Because now I could look at, in this case, I could isolate embryos from whatever stage I want. I could isolate embryos at the single, single fertilized egg and see is, lax, is uh, brachyuria being expressed. And then I could isolate a bunch of embryos at the four cell stage and is, ask is brachyuria expressed. I could do this all through development and I could get a whole expression profile of when and where and in what cells this gene gets turned on. Right? So you can get a lot of data out of this expression vector but it, it's, it's challenging to make. Right? Another way to detect gene expression is through a northern blot. We talked about this a little bit when we were talking about southern blots. Um, a northern blot is where you actually have to dissect up tissue, and we're going to extract RNA. So it's kind of like the first steps of making a, an mRNA uh, or a cDNA library. What we have to do is take tissue from an organism, extract RNA for it, from it, and then you run out the RNA on a gel. This is a little bit easier run up, right? Because I don't have to actually clone anything. I don't have to uh, make an expression vector. All I have to do is just isolate mRNA, OK? So I take mRNA from a couple of different samples. In this little example, I've got one, two, three different tissues that I'm extracting mRNA from. So you take the mRNA, you run it out on a gel, and you get a big streak, right, because we're extracting all the mRNA in the tissue. And with a northern blot, what you're doing is you're probing with a little piece of antisense, so a, a complementary probe sequence that's labeled somehow. And what I'm looking for is, is that complementary sequence found in my mRNA? Right? I'm looking for a particular sequence, so I make an antisense probe, and then I transfer all of my mRNA to a nitrocellulose blot. And then in red here, all these little red guys, is the probe that I've made. So you can just synthetically have this made, just a, a short sequence of, of nucleotides that are complementary to the thing you're looking for. And you just see, does it stick, right? So this is a, a, an example of a northern blot that I pulled off the internet. Uh, this is actually samples taken from multiple cattle in a herd. <laughs> so they isolated tissue from 10 different cattle. And they're looking to see, are these cows expressing this gene that we're interested in? So they took tissue from the, the cattle, isolated mRNA, ran it out on a gel, and now they're probing for certain mRNAs. So in the top, they're doing this in duplicate. But on the top, they're looking for mRNA number one. So they've made some antisense probe to an mRNA. And they're looking, do the cows express this? Cow number one, yeah, expresses it really, really strongly. It's making a lot of this mRNA. This gene is turned on very high in this cow. Um, 
Cow number two, well, it looks like kind of faintly. It's turned on, but not very high, right? Cow number three, yeah, maybe a little bit more than number two, but not as much as number one. So what you can detect is not only is that mRNA made, but at what level is it being expressed? How much of it's getting expressed? Is this a strongly expressed gene or not? And they took the same samples, and they're testing with a different. So you could wash this probe off, make another probe, and see, does gene number two, mRNA number two, is that expressed? Right. And here it's expressed in cow number one. Cow number two doesn't express it. Number three doesn't really express it. So you can get a profile of what the, and what different cows, or you could do this with different cell types, right? You could take a kidney cell and a liver cell, you know, tissues, extract mRNA and probe those. Do they ex express the same genes? Now again, this is just one by one, right? With my expression construct, I was looking for the expression of one, pro uh, one mRNA, right? This, at least with this blot, I can, I can do it over again, but every time you do it, you're just looking for one thing, right? So you can look for one thing and then wash the probe off, look for another thing, wash the probe off. You can do that a couple of times. Um, but you're specifically looking for just one thing at a time. Yeah? It's just the starting material. Oh. A southern blot, you ran out DNA, and so we could do genotyping, looking for things that are expressed in the genome, or, or things that are in the genome, your DNA sequence. A northern blot is just looking at, it's the next step. Instead of doing genomics with a southern blot, because you're looking at what's in the DNA, <clears throat> here we're doing functional genomics. We're looking at what mRNAs are actually made. So the starting material in a northern blot is mRNA, the starting material in a southern blot is DNA. It could be genomic DNA or mitochondrial DNA. So it tells you if a gene is expressed, and whether, when I say expressed, I mean does it get transcribed. It doesn't necessarily tell you if it's being made into protein yet. It's just saying that the cell knows that it's supposed to actually make an mRNA. Same with the reporter construct. The reporter construct is just telling you, did RNA polymerase sit down on this gene and make a copy of the mRNA? It doesn't actually tell you whether or not you've made protein yet. So sometimes mRNAs get made, but they don't, there's a delay between when an mRNA gets made and when a functional protein actually gets made. So if you're looking for a protein coding gene, you'll actually have to look for the protein to know if it's getting made. Questions on northern blot. All right. I'm going to talk about microarrays. A microarray is, well, an array is anything that you've put together in like columns and rows, right? Uh, and a microarray is a bunch of columns and rows. Uh, that have been spotted onto a small uh, slide. It's usually uh, started off being microscope slides, a little slide that you use to mount a sample on, right? Um, those little glass slides, what you can do is actually put DNA and get it to covalently bond to the slide. So you can, and these originally were pretty crude things. You just took a little pipette, you took a sample of, of DNA or RNA, you could just spot it, you know, put a little drop of it onto your slide, and then get it to covalently bond there. So I permanently attached the DNA into a location on the slide. And you could do this for a bunch of different drops, right? As many drops as you could put on the slide, you could covalently bind different DNA to all those little spots, okay? A microarray is where we do that, but we use robotics and spot just tiny, tiny little things on this slide. What a microarray is, is it's a way to detect the expression of multiple genes at the same time. In a northern blot, I had all of my RNA run out on my blot, and the sample was what was permanently bound to the membrane. And my probe is what I changed. Right? I have all this RNA out on my blot in a northern blot, and I'm looking with my antisense probe for a certain mRNA that's in that, that original sample. <clears throat> 
A microarray flips that around. So what you do in a microarray is on this glass slide, you spot onto it probes that you want to detect for. So this blue guy right here is an antisense probe to an mRNA that we're interested in, seeing whether or not that mRNA is expressed in, the, in your sample. And then you just move over a little bit, and you spot on another probe for a different mRNA that you're interested in. So on this slide, you're only limited by how many spots you can get on there. Right? So I've got all of these permanently bound probes. Then what I do is I isolate my mRNA from my sample. And you tag, fluorescently tag is usually how this is done. You fluorescently tag everything in your sample. So in a northern blot, the sample was not tagged. It was the probe. So wherever the probe stuck, the probe would show me that, that there was an mRNA that had the complementary sequence there. In a microarray, all of these probes are unlabeled. But what's labeled is the actual sample that you're going to put on top of this slide. Okay. So you take the sample from your tissue, you label it all, and you soak it on top of your microarray slide and you just allow for anything to bind. So in this microarray, I've got one sample is labeled in red. Okay? So here, my red sample stuck to my probe, and everything else washed away. But also a red sample bound to that probe, and a red sample to that. So I've got three. I can look at on this example, I'm seeing that the sample that I labeled in red, whatever tissue that was from, is expressing those three mRNAs, because it's binding to the probe. right? So you could then wash your microarray off. You could you know, just bring the thing up to a high temperature to break all the hydrogen bonds. And you could wash all the sample. And you could still have your microarray with all your probes. And you could put another sample on top of it and see what sticks to that. So we're doing hybridization, right? We're looking for what's expressed by just what sticks to your probes. The cool thing about a microarray is you can actually, in real time, at the same time, compare two samples. So here, I've got one sample, one tissue that I isolated my stuff from. I labeled all of that mRNA with a red marker. I took a second sample, and I labeled all of that with a green fluorescing marker. And then I took both of those samples and put them on the same microarray. And what I'm doing then is like a competition assay a little bit. right? When I put that probe on my slide, there's probably hundreds of copies of that probe that are all sticking there. And what I'm doing is I'm allowing my two samples to compete for, that, for those available spaces. So it's actually telling you which sample is expressing that gene in higher amounts. This is the readout of a comparison like that. So all of these are, so this is a little picture that was taken of the, of the microarray. And we're looking at the fluorescing molecules that are coming off of this. Right? So a black region here, anywhere you see black, that means no probe or no, none of your samples stuck to the probe that was there. So a black spot means neither of your samples express that mRNA. Nothing stuck to that probe. So that gene, that mRNA, was not made in your sample. Any place you see a red dot means tissue number one that we labeled in red binds exclusively to that probe. So a red spot means that that is a gene that's expressed only in tissue number one. Green spots are mRNAs that are only expressed in tissue number two. No red, pro no red samples stuck to that probe, only green samples stuck to that probe. So I know tissue number two that I labeled in green expresses that gene. Places where you see orange or yellow is where the two genes are both expressed. An equal number of reds and an equal number of greens both stuck to that probe. So what I get is a yellow color. And that says that gene is expressed in both your tissues at the same level. Something in orange would say, well, both of them express it, but sample number one that's in red expresses that gene a little bit more than sample number two does. 
So you're sampling for the expression of multiple genes, however, multiple mRNAs, however many probes that you can get onto that array. You can sample for all of those at the same time. And you can compare one tissue versus another tissue. Which genes are expressed, and how much are they expressed? Does one tissue express them more than another? Uh, there's lots of different uses for this, and I'll end with a little story here about how this is used. Uh, you can do this physiologically, right? If I'm just interested in the genes that are expressed between a kidney and a liver, right? Just to get an idea of what the cell biology of those two are, right? What kind of genes does liver express, and how does that differ from the genes that are expressed in kidney, right? There's going to be some genes that are in common, like all cells have to, you know, copy their genome. So they're all going to be making, you know, DNA polymerase. They're all going to be making RNA polymerase. So those genes are going to be expressed in both of them, and those genes are going to give you yellow spots. Right? But kidney is going to express certain kidney genes, and so whatever we labeled kidney, if that's labeled red, then anything red on the array means that is a gene that exclusively gets expressed in the kidney. If we expressed, if we treated liver tissue with the green one, then any spot here says that's the the mRNA that's exclusively expressed in the liver. Right? So you can do physiological comparative studies between different tissue types. Yeah? So each one of those spots, uh, the probe has, is a different sequence? Mm -hmm. A different sequence that you have designed to whatever mRNAs or non-coding RNAs or whatever thing you want to look for. Well, they're, they're ridiculously tiny. Um, Microarray technology is just limited only by our technology of how small a spot of probe we can get on the slide is. So these originally were macro arrays, and people did this by hand, and so it was you know like half a microliter or so, and so you can only get a certain number of spots on your slide. But as as we get better with robots moving tiny little volumes of liquid, uh, we can actually spot uh, thousands of probes on a single slide. So you could take one sample from your liver, and you could survey for thousands of genes that you want to test whether or not they're expressed. You could do this in development, just like we were talking about with our expression, um, expression vectors. I could just isolate mRNA from all of my developmental stages of whatever organism I'm looking at, and just one by one put them on the microarray. And that'll tell me wit, when and where those genes were expressed. Right? Gene number one got expressed early in development. Gene number two didn't turn on until later, because you're just sampling them over time, developmental time. You could also do this for disease research. You would say, OK, well, I'm interested in lung cancer. So let's take normal lung tissue and put it on the microarray, and that'll tell you what genes get expressed in normal lung tissue. Then you put a cancerous a lung cancer, grow those cells in culture, isolate the mRNA, and look at what are the genes that got turned on or turned off to make that cell cancerous, right? So you can do actual disease research. Uh, if you're you know, looking at you know, Alzheimer's disease or some, you know, any disease you want, you just take diseased and normal tissue, run them on the microarray, and it'll tell you what genes are being expressed in those different types. Um, you could also use it for diagnosis. And this is the story I'll tell you. Um, <clears throat> my friend John Lamute uh, in Santa Barbara, um, really healthy guy, um, but he, had a, he found a lump that he started having, I don't, know, I don't know what his actual symptoms were, but they found a lump of tissue growing in his lungs. And so 10 years ago, if you got a lump in your lungs, well, you've got lung cancer, right? And so there's a certain regimen, a certain way you would treat somebody who has lung cancer. Because different cancers respond to different chemotherapies and different regimens differently. So if you have a bone marrow um, cancer, you would treat that differently than if you have a lung cancer, or treat that differently if you have a prostate cancer. They just respond to different chemotherapies. Um, well, instead of just immediately treating him for lung cancer, though, they went in and biopsied the tissue, took a little bit of tissue out, and then they did a microarray. And they compared the gene expression of that tumor to all of the known gene expression profiles we have for all the cancers. So what we've been doing is just surveying all the cancers, right? If you've got bone marrow, leukemia, we know what the profile of leukemia is. We've done the microarray on leukemia. We've done the microarray on skin cancer. We've done the microarray on all these different cancer types and all the different subtypes of leukemia 
And so we basically know what genes get turned on and which types of cancer. So they did a biopsy of his tumor, and turns out it was not lung tissue that was cancerous. It was bone marrow cancer that had just happened to metastasize and had come into his lung. And so he had, he basically needed the regimen to be treated as if he had leukemia or, or a bone marrow cancer rather than the regimen that you would have used to treat lung cancer. And those two, two regimens, apparently, I don't know much about this, but apparently they're very different. And if they would have treated him as if it was a lung cancer, it probably wouldn't have uh, treated it in time and the tumor would have continued to grow because it would have been unresponsive to the chemotherapies for lung cancer. So he was able to actually identify what kind of cancer he had. They treated it appropriately, and he's been in remission for 10 or 12 years now. But if he had had that tumor 10 years before, before we knew the expression profile of these cancers, uh, he probably wouldn't be alive because that regimen wouldn't have worked, and we wouldn't have known what kind of cancer he had. So this is really powerful stuff to be able to identify which genes are being expressed in tissues. So questions about, about how this works? We've got two minutes, and I want to make sure that you're clear on, on how a microarray works. Yeah? Um, I'm just wondering if, is that the case with any biopsy that they're doing mm -hmm. in a clinic now? Yeah, I mean, most tissues, if you get a biopsy, especially if you have a cancer biopsy, yeah. I mean, they're growing it up in, an, in a culture, and they're looking at, you know, what is, what is the kind of cell? What does the cell look like? Is it long and flat? Is it making long appendages? So they're doing, um, you know, histological analysis of that, but they're also then taking mRNA and, and doing, doing microarrays. And there's, you know, companies out there that that's just what they do, is they just have hundreds of chips that all have different mRNA probes on them, and they, they run your sample through all of these to see what genes you're expressing, so. Here's a microarray chip or slide. They usually call this, so microarrays are sometimes called chips because it's, uh, uh, they call the little profile or the little apparatus they've spotted all these. Uh, can you see this etching in the middle there? That etching is just hundreds, or I'm sorry, thousands of tiny little probes that have all been spotted onto this slide. And so you just take this chip, you just take your sample, you isolate the mRNA and you just put it in a solution and you put a drop of that solution and it just spreads all over the top of your slide and you're just probing your entire sample there. You wash it off and then you look at it under a fluorescent camera that has the resolution to identify all those tiny little spots and what you get is something like this. <laughs> all so what that is is People know the sequence of all, I think it's like something like 13,000 mRNAs. So there's 13,000 mRNAs, and they synthetically made probes for all 13,000 of those genes, spotted them just, you know, micrometers away from each other on this glass slide, washed the sample over top, and so you're looking at the expression profile between two samples at 13,000 genes in one pass. Now, you have to make sure that you get, you know, some controls in there, right, to make sure that this is actually going right. So things like actin, every cell expresses actin. So to make sure that you're loading the same amounts on, sample one and sample two should have equivalent levels of actin, right? So you've kind of calibrated it. And so then if it's a red spot or if it's a green spot, we can tell that there's actually significant real differences in gene expression. Um, but this is amazing, right? We've got basically, People have just made chips that have all of the pieces of mRNA for almost all of the known proteins, right? There's only 24,000 proteins that are expressed in the human genome. So we've got microarray chips that cover all those, those genes. So you could take a sample, ship it off to this company, and they could tell you your tissue, what is expressing in terms of every single protein that we know to be coded for in the genome. And now we're making more and more chips to encompass all these non-coding regions as well. So we can get profiles of what are the microRNAs and the non-coding RNAs that you're expressing as well. So this is functional genomics rather than just sequencing. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.